Good morning, everyone. And I would say good afternoon, good evening, and good night as well, depending on where you are joining us today from. Um, welcome to Come Together Week 2021. Um, we have been organizing Come Together Week for, for a number of years now. And uh, I'll let you know what Come Together Week is. Come Together Week is a celebration of cultural diversity uh, at Georgian College, as well as everywhere around us. And the most beautiful part of cultural diversity is um, that if you are in Canada, um, you experience it at every point in your life, be it in the streets, be it uh, at your workplace or be it in your classroom. For today, uh, we will be talking about uh, uncovering debunking myths, as well as discussing the significance of the turban and hijab. Uh, we have amazing guest speakers who have joined us today to share their wisdom and uh, in order for us to know more about different cultures. I'll uh, switch to Catherine now, uh, who will do the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Sid. Um, we'll start with Georgian College's land acknowledgement to pay respect to the Indigenous people, past and present, who live on this territory. Georgian College acknowledges that all campuses are situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe people. The Anishinaabe include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Georgian College is dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, so let's do some housekeeping rules on how we are going to um, carry on with today's presentation. Uh, we all are muted upon entry. Um, if you have any question and answer, or if you do not have any question and answer, and just want to chat more about that particular culture, or want to gain more information about that cultural piece that we will be sharing, please use the Q&A chat window uh, to ask any questions at any time, and we will be more than happy to share that uh, to share that piece of information more. Uh, we strive to create a safe space to share experiences, spark conversations and embrace diversity and to honor the culture and speakers knowledge and experiences. So in order to do that, please ask questions and make comments with respect. Next slide, please. So we have a number of exciting uh, events planned throughout the week uh, for Come Together Week, which is March 8 to 12. Every day we have we are touching on different topics as well as doing and organizing online events that are not just culture based, but uh, but more of entertainment based as well. And nothing speaks about entertainment more than food. Um, for example, International Potluck on Wednesday. Um, and for you to join these events, we will be posting these links on our social media channels every day uh, in morning. And most of them, actually all of them, um, will be 9 a.m., 10 a.m., uh, depending, um, depending on which day you are joining it at. Next slide, please. So let's uh, let's see a video, uh, and this video covers how we have been organizing Come Together Week in the past few years, uh, when it was a pre-COVID time. I'm sorry. I think there's no sound.
Happy Holi everyone! It's gone! Say hi! <laughs> How are you doing? I'm great, delicious food. How's the food going? So good. So good. Beautiful. My favorite part has been uh, has been the just words that say that everyone has a culture. Um, let's dive right into the cultural piece. Uh, we'll start with the conversation, our conversation with Indrana, who is a present student. Indra, if you can start with uh, telling about yourself first. Hello, folks. This is Indra T Singh. And I am basically from some course. I have been Punjab, India, and I belong to Sikh culture. And right now I am in Canada studying at Georgian with in computer system technician at working. And right now I am in my second semester. Wonderful. And uh, again, when did you come to Canada? Uh, actually, I came last year in September. So very recent. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's talk about and let's uh, let's share wisdom with our viewers today about what Sikh culture is and what is the significance of turban wrapping. So let's start with please about turban, uh, what it is and uh, who wears it. Uh, well, turban is worn by Sikh culture people basically. So like it is a significance of showing that everyone is same. There is no uh, there is no racism or over caste or anything. So like the people who wear turban, they are all equal. Basically, it was uh, during the 17th century when uh, like it became essential for every sick person to wear a turban. Uh, it was started by the 10th Guru of Sikhs, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, who, was, who actually uh, started the Khalsa Panth, which is the main, which is the main reason of wearing the turban uh, and uh, when anyone wears a turban there is no like there is no caste or breed or any kind of thing comes in between them so it is kind of like uh, it is kind of a significance to show that everyone is same in this world beautiful beautiful and uh, does does can anyone can anyone wear a turban to yeah, show the uniformity can, yeah, anyone can wear a turban. Actually, the Sikh gurus uh, decided to uh, end the like the caste system at that time because you we all know that uh, in, during the earlier times uh, there was a caste system and everyone like was very uh, focused on the caste. So they started wearing the turban so that everyone can be same in their own field. Beautiful. That's that's beautiful. So let's let's talk about um, the turban itself. So for for the turban cloth, how long is the turban cloth? Actually, it depends on person to person. Some people like like to have it very long, and others like to wear a short one. So basically, the average uh, average length is five to six inches. Sorry, feet. Five to six feet. feet. Yeah. yeah, and how much the and how much time does it usually take? Uh, usually take to tie a turban. Uh, well, like I have been tying it since long time, so it usually takes ten to fifteen minutes for me. But when like I started wearing it, 
so it was around 30 to 40 minutes for me wow and you have to do it every day yeah almost every day like whenever i have to go anywhere so i have to be a dog beautiful beautiful that's that's beautiful thank you so much and thank you so much for that thank you for having me yeah next slide please okay, let's uh, let's talk about the significance of hijab now um if you can have mustafa yes hi sid hi everyone good morning hi mustafa uh, let's uh, let's start with telling the viewers who you are and uh, and uh, how long you've been in canada for Uh, yeah, uh, I work at Georgian College. My name is Mustafa Aydin. I work at Georgian College as a regional manager. Um, and uh, I have been in Canada for uh, 17 years now. Quite a long time. Wow. Um, and now we can we can definitely dive right into uh, what is hijab and what is the significance of hijab and any cultural information that uh, that viewers should be aware of that obviously coming from different cultures that we do not know uh, much about. Uh, yeah, so the basically hijab is a common definition uh, of uh, preferring modesty in clothing. That's the general uh, common definition of hijab. So as you know, in many beliefs, in many religions that i know of uh showing off is not very welcomed it's considered a sin so showing off your very luxurious watch showing off your car house whatever you have uh in addition to that showing off your the some parts of your body uh that may attract other people uh that's why i mean many religions that i know of the big religions we always talk about they always advise people to uh choose modesty in every part of their lives and in clothing as well so that's what we call hijab in general uh that requires um uh people to cover their uh bodies from uh shoulders to uh to feet basically choosing uh loose clothes uh not to expose uh the uh, the parts of the bodies that may attract other people to create a sexual interest rather than uh uh creating a, a kind of uh, interest for their virtues because all the religions and beliefs says that just your virtues are more important not your appearance so if you want to attract people use your virtues choose people uh virtues people to get married to that's the only advice that that i got from the religion so uh basically hijab is the most common one when we look at hijab we see it in the uh devoted christian nuns So when you go to Rome or you go to a church you see nuns so they pretty much their clothes are, are a good example for hijab and majority of the muslim world wear hijab basically hijab is covering your hair uh covering your body from um from your shoulders to to feet uh and and that's pretty much it but we have another versions of hijab they are mostly like uh confused with hijab a lot uh we call them niqab uh niqab or burqa so uh niqab basically you cover your body like hijab then after that you cover your face as well just your eyes can be seen uh in burqa you cannot nobody can see your eyes as well this is completely uh covered with a veil there are little dots that you can see outside of the world so that's more like a traditional rather than the religious uh because it it, it goes way back to byzantine empire actually uh byzantine empire for those who are not familiar byzantine empire is an empire uh uh whose uh, capital city was constantinopolis so istanbul right now to in turkey so and using burqa in those times was a sign of being classy uh being like aristocrat and uh, yeah so that's 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 an interesting thing and and right now so we don't see burqas everywhere some parts of the muslim world that we see and um and haradi jews uh we call them orthodox jews like devoted jews uh jews jews women uh can basically use burqas as well and um but uh, a burqa or or hijab so it's the personal choice but the religions only ask people to cover the places that shouldn't uh they shouldn't be exposed to other people other than the family or relatives or household basically that's the general idea um 
the hijab is is choosing modesty. That's basically what I would uh, uh, you know uh, define it. Uh, the, but there are some myths, of course. Uh, hijab is only for women. No, uh, hijab is for men as well. Uh, so the men, if they have a nice looking biceps or very nice body, they cannot expose it. They, they, they have to they have to wear hijab basically a loose clothing. So they have to be modest. They shouldn't show off. Uh, and that's one of those things. The second thing is uh, covered women are more devoted than the ones that don't prefer to be covered. It has got nothing to do with it is one of the uh, one of the things that the religion asks people to have. Uh, but there are a lot of other things, mostly uh, moral and 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 virtual things. Uh, second thing, uh, third thing is that uh, it is a sign, it is a symbol. Uh, it is not a requirement. No, it is basically. I mean, for my religion, I can speak of. Uh, so it is a God's uh, order. So it is not something that you choose as a symbol to show people who you are. It's not that. It is what you have to be. And so it's sometimes it's not quite understood because in some countries burkas are banned. Uh, there is a logic behind it. That's understandable because there is the face recognition right now. Uh, we use the technology to identify people, identify thieves, identify murderers. And and so I can be in a burqa and nobody could recognize me, basically. And uh, so that's why that's that there is a logic that is understandable as well. Uh, it's it's pretty much it uh, about hijab and burkas. Uh, it's a prefer personal preference. Uh, it's a modest way uh, in clothing. That's what I would call it. Beautiful, Mustafa. I, I had two questions, but you already answered both of them. I was going to ask about the history uh, and then I was going to ask about if anyone can wear it and you answered both the questions already. Very well explained. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we I'm going to talk with Catherine because Catherine has spent a number of years in Middle East and uh, she has a different perspective as well uh, because going from Canada to Middle East, spending years there with the locals and getting to know them and being within their culture, adapting, adapting the culture, learning the culture is a different set of experience too. So Catherine, over to you. <clears throat> Yeah, oh, thank you so much, Sid, for inviting me to uh, speak about uh, my lived experience as, as a non-Muslim of um, hijab. Um, you know, uh, as a, as a non-Muslim growing up in North America, um, hearing this narrative of hijab as, uh, you know, symbol of oppression, I guess I just kind of absorbed this stereotype and it um, became my way of thinking about it as well. Um, and I also kind of went along with the thinking that, you know, if women were given a choice that they would, you know, take off their hijab straight away and much prefer to dress like we do in the West, you know, these ways of thinking. Um, and then I moved to the Middle East and I worked at a women's college, as you said, with, um, I worked with Emirati students and uh, also with women and colleagues from all over the Muslim world um, who, who covered. And this was a, a really huge learning experience for me. Um, I, I, I remember a pivotal moment was, uh, in, in my understanding of hijab, was uh, when my students uh, one day said to me, uh, Miss, you know, we love you. Uh, we'll care for you, even though your family, your husband, your, your father uh, don't. And I was kind of, you know, taken aback and surprised. And I said, oh, you know, my family loves me. Why, why do you think that? And they said, because, you know, you, you can go out like this in public and without covering and um, it was a total blow my hair back moment a cultural moment to, to realize that my understanding of hijab was so completely not aligned with with theirs who, who wore it and that for them hijab was a, a symbol of love and protection and privacy and um, that it was also you know many many other things um, as, as uh, Mustafa mentioned, uh, very much so about uh, uh, modesty and, and morality. Um, the, uh, but it, it's, it's, it was so many other things that I saw uh, as well that um, like cultural solidarity, um, unity, group belonging, these, these things were all wrapped up in, in wearing hijab for the women that I knew there. Um, 
So the local women in the UAE wear uh, Shela and Abaya, so that they call hijab Shela there. Um, but I also worked with, um, you know, women from Palestine and all over the Middle East, um, and everybody had their own um, style, their own way of, of wearing hijab. Um, you know, the, the Palestinian women had amazing embroidery. Um, the, um, the, the women in, in UAE had a very sparkly um, uh, sequins on their, on their shelas. So um, it was uh, not just sort of this uh, group solidarity. It was, it was also a kind of a heritage like ancestry tradition of, of your group and and it was also a way to be an individual uh as well uh because everybody wore a slightly different um style or, or not uh, wrapping around style um and a uh, little bit of different expression on on hijab so it could be both the group belonging uh, as well as the individual expression. So yeah, I, I just uh, started to understand uh, really well from, from the women I was with about um, how hijab is definitely not something that women would throw away the first chance they had, um, that it's, uh, it, it's not a symbol of oppression the way I grew up believing that it was, but that it's kind of the opposite. It's like a, almost a symbol, of, it's, it's a symbol of liberation for many of the women that I knew. Um, empowerment, you know, giving women agency, uh, uh, they control who, who sees them. And um, that's, you know, uh, protection, uh, insulation from, from the gaze of those who you don't want it from. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just really grateful to the women in my life and in, in my experience that have um, shown me this sort of monolithic way of, of thinking about hijab um, that I used to have, that, you know, covering meant you were um, subservient in some way um, is is actually the at, total opposite. Um, you know, women who wear hijab, they're they're business women, they're surgeons, mathematicians, doctors, lawyers, politicians. You know, you name it. And um, so this this is uh, such a misnomer that that um, that we often think about in in the West. Um, oh, and I have a picture here. I love that this uh, this is Gisela Massa. She is uh, an anchor woman on CBC. Um, and what she said is, judge me for what is in my head, not, it, not what is on my head. So I thought that was a, a beautiful way to um, kind of sum up uh, this this um, debunking of these myths and and um, yeah, I just want to you know once again thank all the women in my life who gave me some insights into uh, what wearing hijab means and uh, busting my stereotypes that I got uh, you know from from people who don't even actually wear hijab. So um, thank you very much, Sid, for for your for inviting me today. That was that was beautiful. That was beautiful, Catherine. Um, the, I think the most important lesson I learned from your story is that there are so many underlying parts uh, about our culture that we do not even know about, the gems. And the most important thing is not to assume things uh, yes. because it's all about awareness and curiosity, right? Absolutely, yes, yeah. It's, um, it, it, you know, it, it just, um, it's an amazing thing to uh, learn so uh, deeply from from people whose experiences of something are completely different than what you ever thought. So yeah, so right. cool. And the line that you said that and in the end, um, judge me what's in my mind and not what's on my uh, what what's in my head and what's not on my head. Um, it totally says about the life experiences that we do not know that the other person goes through or has gone through the valuable life lessons. Um, that's what uh, that's what should be focused more. That's what was wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, Sid. Uh, while we are on that topic, let's uh, let's watch a video um, to to know more about.
Today, I brought the book, The Proudest Blue. It's written by Olympic medalist Ibtihaj Muhammad and SK Ali. And the art is by a Canadian named Hatem Ali. It's a great book. The Proudest Blue, a story of hijab and family. Mama holds out the pink. Mama loves pink. But Asaya shakes her head. I know why. Behind the counter is the brightest blue, the color of the ocean if you squint your eyes and pretend there's no line between the water and the sky. It's the first day hijab. Asaya knows it, and I know it. We're sisters. The next day, I wait. A new backpack, light up shoes. I feel special. I feel like twirling. Asaya comes out of the house and I stop. It's the most beautiful first day of school ever. I'm walking with a princess, so I pretend I'm one too but even princesses have to stop to cross the street. Asaya takes my hand in hers, says, come on, Faiza, we speed walk it. 14 steps, 14 light ups to get across. Asaya takes me to my line first, hugs me goodbye. I turn to watch her leave, give a little curtsy to the princess going to the sixth grade area. She's easy to see, Good job. Her hijab smiles at me the whole way. My first day hijab is going to be blue too. What's that on your sister's head? The girl in front of me whispers. A scarf, I whisper back. I don't know why a whisper came out. I try again, louder now. A scarf, hijab. Oh, she whispers. You can see them standing in line. Asaya's hijab isn't a whisper. Asaya's hijab is like the sky on a sunny day. The sky isn't a whisper. It's always there, special and regular. The first day of wearing hijab is important, Mama had said. It means being strong. I turn, but I can't see the blue anymore. I run to the big kid's side, 27 steps to see Asaya. I need to give her another hug. I need to see her smile. Faiza, Asaya's eyes wonder why I'm here. Are you excited, I ask, about the first day of hijab? She nods, smiling big, and I feel better. Someone laughs from nearby, a boy pointing at Asaya. Why? Asaya's hijab isn't a laugh. Asaya's hijab is like the ocean waving to the sky. It's always there, strong, and friendly. Some people won't understand your hijab, Mama had said, but if you understand who you are, one day they will too. In class, I draw a picture. You can see the picture right here. Two princesses in hijab having a picnic on an island where the ocean meets the sky. The girl who whispered in line says she likes it. She says it's so loud, the teacher comes over to see it. I wonder if Asaya drew a picture too. Recess time is for five cartwheels in a row. I land the, le the last one near the sixth graders, near Asaya and her friends, near a boy yelling, I'm gonna pull that tablecloth off your head. Mm -mm. Saya's hijab is in a tablecloth. 
Messiah's job is blue, only blue. Messiah turns away, her friends turn away. They race to the middle of the schoolyard, their shoes pounding the pavement, playing tag. Mama, don't carry around the hurtful words that others say. Drop them. They are not yours to keep. They belong only to those who said them. Some good advice from Mama. It takes me 48 steps to get away from the yelling boy. You want to count the steps? I'm not going to count the steps. After school, I look around. I look for whispers, laughs, and shouts. But I only see Asaya waiting for me, like it's a regular day. She's smiling, strong. We cross the road, hand in hand. I can't wait to get home to show Mama the picture that I drew to show Asaya that I'm wearing the same hijab in it. Because Asaya's hijab is like the ocean and the sky, no line between them, saying hello with a loud wave, saying, I'll always be here like sisters, like me and Asaya. The end. was wonderful. Catherine, maybe you can let us know more about Amber? Yeah, thanks, Sid. Yeah, um, actually, the, um, the, the video that we just watched, uh, the story called The Proudest Blue, um, is part of a series that Barrie Public Library has on. So Amber, who was reading this story, um, is one of their reading champions. She, she's from um, her, she started her own uh, enterprise called the Hello Code, which basically helps people be brave when they're meeting new people. Um, and the story she read, The Proudest Blue, I, I love the story because, you know, it's sort of a coming of hijab age story that many um, people might may not be familiar about sort of, you know, the excitement of um, a new experience like, like the one that um, this girl had in this book. Um, I love that they found, you know, um, that, the, that the sisters uh, really helped each other and, and had this bond and that, um, you know, they they found ways to be strong when others were hurtful, but and, and basically in that pride of being who you are. So I, I loved that story. And it was written by Ibtihad Muhammad, who is an Olympic gold medalist from America um, and a social justice advocate. So she was a fencer um, in, in uh, the U.S. who um, won a medal and she was the I believe one of, or maybe the first um, uh, Muslim to wear a hijab when competing in an Olympic event. So um, she's she's a very iconic figure. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Catherine. Beautiful. Um, now, whole week, come together week, March 8 to 12, we are going to have language lessons uh, in which we will tell you how to pronounce certain ways, way, uh, certain words of a particular language. So first up is Spanish that will be taught by Claudia. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Sid. Uh, my name is Claudia Diaz Castillo. Uh, I just want to say hello to everyone who is watching and the ones that are going to be watching eventually, even if it's the recorded session. Um, I have to say that it's an honor for me to uh, be able to contribute to this awesome initiative. Uh, I, I love these languages lessons, they're, they're really good. And I feel that uh, language is an essential part of identity. And, and it's really awesome that Georgian College is uh, uh, implementing this section in the Come Together Week. So I'm really happy uh, to, to tell you guys a little bit about Spanish. I am from Peru. Um, and so that's one of the countries where we speak Spanish in South America. I mean, most South Americans speak Spanish except Brazil and one of the Guyanas. 
Uh, but I can tell you a bit of I have a nice script here, so I'm going to kind of read it for a second. You know, one of the official languages is Argenti uh, of the official countries where Spanish we uh, it's the spoken language is Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Equatorial Guinea, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, which is my country, Puerto Rico, Spain, Uruguay, and Venezuela. But you know, there are a lot of native speakers. Uh, well, 450 million, it's a lot. Uh, I didn't have that number in, my, in the top of my mind, so I'm learning here as well, at least refreshing some info, so that's awesome. <laughs> and um, I just have to say, I may be biased, but I think Spanish is just beautiful. <laughs> so I'm going to just start with the three basic words that it's going to open a lot of doors for you once you travel, because I know everyone is waiting just for the quarantine to be over and well for the pandemic to get in a better stage in a control stage so that we can travel. So uh, these are awesome examples and it's just the basic hello, goodbye and thanks, right? So I'm going to start with the first one. It's hello and uh, in Spanish we say hola. I know we have an H there and normally you will say hola, but no, we don't pronounce the H in Spanish. So you can just say hola, right? So every time you just get in in a room with people, they're, we're normally noisy, so just don't be afraid. Just say hola. And if you want to add something else, you could use hola amigos. If you want to say hello friends. <laughs> so that's a good one, hola, hola. And then the, the, the other one is goodbye, right? Uh, so we we have several uh, ways to do it, but that one is actually the most common one, and, and it's adios, adios. We say, uh, and you know, we normally when we when we say hi and when we say bye, we normally kiss each other, which again that's not allowed anymore. <laughs> so it's kind of hard, but as 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 long as you say, you know, you just wave and say adios. I have to go now. It was nice <laughs> so that we, we all get it now. Uh, so we, we'll get that uh, the you're saying bye. And then um, if you want to say thanks, which is a nice word for Canadians, it's actually a representative world, I will say. Uh, and sorry too. Uh, so if you want to say thanks, you just say gracias. Gracias. Um, and uh, that's that's a nice word that uh, I have to say uh, all the foreigners that uh, we received before I came to Canada, they're, they're normally really uh, well behaved and really nice and kind and they always are asking these uh, kind of uh, words to learn so that they are able to communicate in a language even in a basic level. So, so Gracias uh, for everyone to <laughs> hearing this basic lesson. I'm going to add one more, which is please. So in Spanish, we say por favor. And one that every single foreign I've encountered in Peru knows is how to ask for a beer. So if they want to say a beer, please, they say una cerveza, por favor. And they always get it right. I don't know how, I don't know why but they're always skilled to ask for that one <laughs> so anyway uh, i think that's all i wanted to share with you for now uh so just hola for hello uh thanks for gracias um and goodbye adios that was very beautiful claudia that was very beautiful and trust me you are not biased espanol es muy bonita <laughs> I hope oh. I hope that was right. <laughs> oh, it was perfect. Thank you. Well, yeah, definitely Spanish is very beautiful, no doubt in that. Um and while while we while you were talking about Spanish, I definitely I would definitely say that even I got to know a lot about Hindi, just like you got to know about the the numbers associated with how many people speak Spanish. I got to know a lot about Hindi as well. So um Hindi is one of the one of the uh, one of the official language of uh, of India. 
we have two official languages which is hindi and english there are over 20 and i'm not reading i'm not reading the the script there right now it's i just learned before before our um before our session today so there are over 23 uh, recognized languages of india over 19500 uh, mother tongues five more than 5000 dialects and more than 25,000 different newspapers and magazines in these languages. So I got to learn a lot of things too. And even though after learning so many numbers, how many languages we have, India has zero, that's right, zero national language. Uh, because, because on how many cultures and how many languages we have, we cannot recognize one language to be representing 1.3 billion people. So there's just official languages which are used in Parliament, Hindi and English, and no national language. Um, just like how Claudia said, um, India 425 million native speakers and 120 million second language speakers. Largest Hindi speaking countries are India with 422 million uh, speakers and Nepal 8 million speakers. Now I'm going to tell you three things that you can uh, you can use uh, if you are having a conversation with someone who speaks Hindi. The very simple one is hello and bye. Now we like to keep it simple because um, India it's all about authority and ranking. For example, if you are talking to someone um, who is very much older in age, for example, your grandparents, how you greet them is totally different than how you would greet um, a younger person. So one way of, uh, of greeting someone regardless of their age is Namaste. And when we when we do Namaste, it's it's with the gesture of holding your hands and bowing down, your, bowing down your head um, and saying Namaste. Why we do that is while when we do Namaste, we believe that we believe that when we join our hands and bow, we believe that no one um, in uh, no one in this world is superior than the other person. And not, doesn't matter how powerful or how rich we might be, even then I, I bow down uh, in, in gratitude in front of you. Um, next is see you soon, which is Jaldi Milenge. It's Jaldi Milenge. We'll see you soon. And the last one, which is very important again, uh, especially in Canada, as Claudia said, is uh, Shukriya. But we, we go with more Dhanyawad. We go with both, shuk I, as I said, a lot of languages, a uh, lot of different words. Um, it's Shukriya as well as Dhanyawad. It's Dhanya. I know the sound is different because D and H makes a different um, sound in India. It's Dhanya Wad or Shukriya. So I'll, I'll end the language lesson of Hindi with, uh, with again, same Namaste. Next slide, please. So we every uh, come together week, we have a photo contest in which uh, we ask our students to submit uh, student uh, submit their photo entries for different different uh, uh, portfolios. For this one, the category was culture. Uh, this photo was submitted by Juhil Italia. So this photo represents one of the culture, uh, one of the festival of India, which is Holika Dahan. It's called Holika Dahan. It's an ancient story of little uh, Prahalada worships Lord Vishnu, which is one of the gods and being tried to kill by his own father, the Lord of all negatives, Hiran Yakashipu, multiple times, but saved by Lord Vishnu every single time. Holika Dahan relates to how people should worship their God and how the God is with us in every situation, which is the positivity around us. Doesn't matter how negative the situation might get, how negative um, um, the life might seem, there will always be one one ray of hope, uh, positivity, positive vibe that will come out and will uh, negate everything. Next slide, please. Now this is one of the best things about Come Together Week because the we have these poems submitted by students who are learning English at Georgian College. 
uh, they're from different countries, culture, region, religion, and they submitted the poem composed by them about where they are from, and it's called Where I Am From. So this poem is by Emiro Mendoza. Where I am from? I am from where people eat ajiaco or bandeja pies. Where people meet at Christmas for nine nights. I am from a place where we take trips in a beetle through the mountains. Where the landscapes and weather change quickly. I am from where there are holidays for everything. Where people sing and dance on the streets or buses. I'm from where there are tiny stores everywhere and the shopkeepers talk to you like a friend. I'm from where the land smells delicious and fresh, where you can enjoy the most delicious coffee in the world. I'm from where you can enjoy the bike way every Sunday, where you can dance, ride and jog. I'm from Emiro and Cecilia where I belong to a beautiful family with dreams and hope. One of the beautiful things why, uh, why these poems are close to my heart is because even though we, we feel that uh, the words are simple, uh, it's just that these poems are composed by students whose first language is not English. When they started learning, when they started composing this, these poems, even before that, they did not know much about English. They did not know how to even say a complete sentence grammatically correct. Um, so composing a poem and putting the emotions into these words, uh, letting the world know where they're from, what culture represents their country and themselves as an identity, it's the most beautiful feeling. Last, uh, I think 2019, uh, George and Collis started Say My Name campaign, and that was initiated by Enactus as well as George and Collis Student Association. The purpose of uh, com so purpose of Say My Name was everyone has a particular name, everyone, and that name represents their identity. I won't disclose much. I will let the next slide, which is uh, which is a video of Ishan explaining what Say My Name campaign is, uh, explain itself. Hello everyone, my name is Ishan Sasdeva and here's how my name is pronounced. For all those of you who often get your name mispronounced like myself, say my name provide ways you can help people learn to pronounce your name without thinking that you have to stay silent or use a nickname. This process truly helps each and every individual to embrace their identity and actively engage in a group promoting positive communication. Hello everyone. So just, just like I said that everyone has an identity and um, if you have to have a nickname uh, for others uh, to make it easier for others to pronounce it and if you're not feeling comfortable with that, it's always easy to let the other people know how it's pronounced because again, um, it's understandable because every country has different dialects and how the words are pronounced. Um, it's always easy to make the other person understand and teach. We'll end the session uh, with a very beautiful video that was uh, that was made uh, by the staff members of International Education and Development Team. Uh, this video was made uh, last year during the COVID times when even when we all were working from home and we were not able to reach out uh, to students in a personal um, human touch manner that we used to in pre-COVID times, we wanted to let them know that even though times are tough, even though we are not able to see you in person, even though you might feel that you are by yourself, we are there for you. And we'll have the video now. No one told you life was gonna be this way. Jobs remote, you broke, you hide it from the plague. 
So as we said, that doesn't matter how long we are um, we are studying remotely or working remotely or we won't be seeing you on campus for. We are there for you for sure. Now we'll open the platform for Q&A if any. Um, any any question or any or anything you want to ask about any particular culture uh, that made you curious about to learn more things mm -hmm. or uh, just to inquire more about that, you can use the Q&A portion. Oh, OK. Yes, Catherine. Yes, one question. Definitely. Um, actually, it's a question for Inder. Um, I um, thank you so much for sharing about, uh, you know, um, Sikhism and, and turbans. And I was wondering, I was in Amritsar uh, a long time ago where the Golden Temple is, and there were some gentlemen there who had, uh, you know, uh, very elaborate turbans. They seemed to have some kind of ceremonial dress. Do you? Do you know anything about um, uh, this way of, of wearing the turban, Inder? Yeah, so actually there are kind of like many type of turbans that people like to tie. So these are like worn by the uh, persons who belong to uh, Khalsa Pan and we call them Nihangs. So actually those those are the people who wear those kind of turbans. OK, thank you. And they have a special role? Uh, actually, they are like they are from the uh, army of the six, so they used to wear this. OK, as we can see that they belong to the army of the Guru, so they used to wear these kind of turbans. Shukriya, thank you. Catherine, there is one there is one example of that like big turbans in my culture and I didn't know the meaning uh, uh, before uh, so the basically the sultans put a lot of turbans on the top of their hairs 
Uh, it was, I mean, of course, there, there was a reason behind it. So when they go to war, when they die there, they basically they need to be wrapped up in a white cloth. So oh. and they carry it on the top of their hats. At the same time, it means that the, the death is above my head all the time. I have to remember that, that I'm going to die one day and I have to make my decision wisely. So that's one of those Tarban uh, examples in my culture too. Amazing, amazing. By the way, so today marks the very important day, International Women's Day today. Uh, so I would like to congratulate everyone every Women's Day here. So the world would be a, a terif terrific place without women, that's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> Definitely. Thanks for them to be here with us on this planet. And uh, yeah, yeah. And thanks for keeping us sane. <laughs> <laughs> and absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Mustafa. And Mustafa, I, I completely agree with what you said because we have a saying, uh, same thing, and I think Inder, Inder can uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we have a saying that Sar par kafan banna. That's the same thing that when we go to war, we are wearing yeah. that thing on our head so that uh, even if we die, uh, we, I'm not scared of dying. Even if we die, uh, I'm prepared to die for the country. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I'm not seeing any questions. Do we uh, have any questions within from within the panelists? No. Perfect. So it's 10:56. We were very uh, uh, very accurate about the time. Thank you so much, Sean and Josiah, for um, making sure the presentation would run uh, very perfectly and very smoothly. Thank you so much, Indrajit, Mustafa, and Catherine. Uh, to take out time from your busy schedule and making sure that we aware we kick off uh, kickstart this uh, come together week and uh, we make sure that the viewers are more culturally aware of uh, different cultures that may might not be aware of thank you so much everyone just thank make you. sure that we have uh, come together week running from march 8 to 12. every day in the morning we will be posting the new links um uh, new links for the session um, if you and you do not need to be a present student uh, to to view these. If you know anyone who is going to be a prospective student at Georgian for summer or for fall, uh, make sure to share the link. Thank you so much, Sid. Great, uh, great show today. I really enjoyed speaking and listening to everybody. Thank you. Thanks Sid, for having us. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.